Thanks, Megan. Um, so I have a couple of slides from a recent talk that I thought I'd share to give an overview of what I've been doing. Um, but feel free to jump in and ask questions or interrupt me. I'm uh, in, the, in the spirit, the informal spirit of this, I, I'd like to maintain that. Um, so my name is Melanie Kammer. I'm a postdoc with the USDA ARS in uh, University Park, PA. So there's currently snow on the ground here. Um, a different form of precip than you might have been hoping for, Megan. Um, but I'd like to share a little bit of my postdoc project where we're trying to estimate landscape flowers available for bees, and specifically how I've been using land fire products in that uh, evolving process, I'll call it. So bees need flowers. I'm not going to belabor this slide, um, but there's surprisingly few uh, papers and publications that look at landscape scale availability of uh, floral resources. So that was my focus for this project. And this really builds on work by my colleague and co-author Aaron Iverson, who did a pretty extensive plant survey of the Finger Lakes region of New York. He looked at 144 sites of 22 different habitat types and um, developed this framework of essentially the pieces of information that we would need to know in order to estimate landscape flowering. Um, so I've tried to break it down here. Uh, essentially, we need a habitat map of some sort, information of about which plants are present in a given habitat, information on the phenology of the flowering, um, and then how much flowering we might expect. So I tend to separate this into species abundance information, and then um, uh, flower density and size. So at a species level, what's a typical number of flowers per unit area or, um, and also the average size of a flower. Um, so basically by combining all this information together, um, Aaron developed these floral area curves for the Finger Lakes. So we're looking at the meters squared of flowers per hectare of habitat for these 22 different habitat types. Um, and we were interested to see that there's massive variation and both the timing as well as the magnitude of flowering um, between these different habitats. Um, but I think the point for this presentation is more that what we're doing with this information is combining it with the amount of habitat in a given uh, spatial extent. And then we can build up to a landscape scale representation of uh, floral resources available. Um, in this case, mostly thinking about bees, but potentially all pollinators. So when I started my project, um, I was really interested in thinking about how we might generalize this method um, to new geographic areas. So assuming we don't have this really detailed um, empirical data set and a botanist like Aaron, um, what are our options for substituting out um, some of the regional information that Aaron used and um, using additional uh, representations of plant communities in, in, in uh, more places, essentially? So my first step for trying to do that was um, generating a relevant national habitat map. So the work in the Finger Lakes relied on um, a couple different uh, geospatial data sets, but the, uh, in a, there was a one that was the Nature Conservancy's Northeast habitat map. So we were interested in swapping that out for a national layer. Um, so here's where I, I discovered land fire maybe about a year ago and started um, uh, became quite interested in using the National Vegetation Classification raster, um, but for the purposes of pollinator habitat, we also need to know, in some cases, uh, identity of specific crops. So I've actually been combining this layer with the cropland data layer, which is perhaps a little circular because I know that the CDL was part of how this layer was developed. Um, but for our purposes, we needed to know differences between, say, wheat and soybean, for example. So the next step is um, trying to characterize plant communities with existing data sets. So the which plants, who, and how much. And here I'm using the, ref the land fire reference database. Um, so this is actually an outdated map. This was from the um, last version, 1.0 version of the reference database. So I need to update my figure with the new um, remap version. But in the Northeast, there are what I thought a lot of plot visits, and I'm essentially looking at the overlap in which species are present in the land fire reference database and also in this um, empirical data set that we have of bloom density. 
And by combining these two things, then I can um, estimate the land, meter, again, get to that meter squared of flowers per, hec per hectare of habitat. Um, and I don't actually have the number of species here. We're still working on the latest version of this empirical data set, but that should be coming soon. Um, and then eventually the vision for this project is to try to get to a regional map of floral resources within a season. Um, I've been thinking about this kind of in a web mapping framework where a user could click on a point and then get back this floral area curve for their landscape and potentially compare um, different locations in terms of the in terms of the timing and magnitude of flowering for say perhaps apiary sites. Um, okay, so for the office hour discussion, what I hope will be a discussion, um, I wanted to share a little bit um, of why I've been using Landfire. So I mentioned that I chose this layer partly because it does have national coverage. Um, and I was also really excited about this possibility of being able to pair the vegetation raster with information from the reference database um, and have over the course of this project sort of come to think of this as basically a, at least a start towards being able to map plant traits and probably not the only, surely not the only person that has done this, but for my project, I was specifically interested in describing floral area per vegetation type and then being able to map the spatial distribution of floral area across the Northeast. Um, but as I've shared this with some other landscape ecologists and pollinator folks, there's a lot of interest in mapping some other plant traits that are relevant for pollinators. So in addition to floral area, um, being able to make maps of say pollen or nectar nutrition, so pro protein content of pollen or lipids or sugar content of nectar, um, these sort of other flowering traits um, so I think that building this methodology on the reference database allows us to get back to that species level information um, so we can um, expand into new areas in the future. Okay, so some of the challenging questions, challenges and questions that I kind of had um, developing this project and actually why I started um, coming to some of these office hours. Um, move, like this isn't really a question, but more just a challenge, I guess, was I discovered that the reference database has uh, relatively poor coverage for certain vegetation types. So for example, some of the agricultural types that I think were drawn from the cropland data layer, there weren't really any field plots um, uh, for those vegetation types. So I've been um, addressing this by supplement, supplementing with some additional data sets. Uh, which I hope I can encourage some of the folks who provided me these data to then also provide it back into the Landfire program um, because I've seen quite a lot of value in um, this reference database. But I would say my biggest sort of overarching challenge has just been trying to find the relevant documentation to understand um, where these layers came from and um, just start to wrap my head around what I actually need to know in order to use them. So for example, I came to the first or one of the first office hours I attended was about the reference database to try to learn more about this auto key program that labels the field plots. And also my collaborators were asking me about, well, how does the reference database work with all these different methods used to measure plant communities and what influence might that have on our methodology? Um, also, I, I guess I still have some questions about definitions of some of the vegetation classes. Um, for example, row crop versus close grown crop which I'm fairly certain, again, are drawn from the CDL, but I haven't been able to find anywhere how Landfire took the CDL and actually uh, condensed that down into these broader classes, agricultural classes. And then um, a little bit more broadly, just more information about the geospatial workflow that was used to create this NVC raster. Um, I've been doing some reading about the vegetation mapping, um, but I'm a little fuzzy about how the national vegetation classification is different than the other existing vegetation type and sort of what the updates have been for the remap um, program. I found the Rollins et al. 2006 report, which has a lot of detail. So I guess my maybe final question is, is there a remap equivalent of this comprehensive documentation in this report? Um, so I think I'll stop there and Hopefully this will lead to a great discussion. 
Hi, Melanie, Randy. I just want to say thank you. Um, you set a high bar for just quickly and clearly presenting the issues and laying out the questions for us. So thank you. I, I don't think I'm the person to take on these questions or the best person anyway, so I'll open the floor. But again, just wanted to thank you for this. And this is, I think it should be a great conversation. I'm sure other people have similar questions. So maybe, uh, yeah, I'll open it up to others from Lampfire to jump in on this. Um, this is Angela Puma. I can start. Um, obviously, Darren is probably better for some of these questions. But um, first, I just want to say, like, how cool. This is a cool project. And um, it's so to see our data used in this way. Um, because, you know, we hope that it does, but we don't always see the examples. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump to your uh Question number three there is a version, is there a version two equivalent um, to that report? And um, and there is going to be. Um, okay. <laughs> so, um, so it's been written, um, you know, we're just trying to figure out how to get it out there right now. So um, if there are specific details, um, like you have some of those questions above, um, you know, I can get you that information. Um, okay. but in, in, and then just addressing, um, yeah, so uh, we don't have, you were very correct in thinking that our agriculture, agri agriculture is pretty much based on CDL um, almost entirely. And so we don't um, model those classes out um, like we do the vegetation. So they're just, it's a straight lookup table um, in a lot of ways from the CDL. Um, and then, uh, Darren, you do have a, a, a table explaining the, how you aggregate some of the, I feel like we looked at that together recently, <laughs> they aggregate, aggregate some of those agricultural classes. Yeah, we have that. We can share that if that's, okay. if that's all right with everyone. And then let's see. Um, okay. Melanie, um, this is Jim. I'm the program lead for Land Fire for the Nature Conservancy. So I was involved in the auto key process. So let me try to answer that question for you, which is we do have reports for every auto key region, um, how that auto key was developed, okay. both ecological systems and NVC. And we also have an assessment of the quality of that auto key ass uh, assignment okay. for each of the auto key regions, which I can provide you. And honestly, I do not know if they're on the website. I think we intended to, but it may have been one of those things that slipped through the cracks that we never got to uh, post, but we do have those. Mm -hmm. and I can okay. provide them to you. I could, we could even provide the program to you, but I will tell you it's not, it wasn't developed to be a land fire deliverable. It's mm -hmm. used version of access, et cetera, et cetera. So it may not be something that you could just install. Mm -hmm. Work, um, work uh, internally for yourself to do your own plots. Okay. Um, I don't know that for sure, but it's been, it's an old, it's an old program. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know that for a fact. So, um, but I'll look into that and see what I can find out. Uh, but but okay. certainly I have those reports and I can provide those reports to you. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, I think in terms of the accuracy part, I'd found what looked to be like a spatial agreement between the field plot label and the or the reference database label yes. and the final raster. But I think yes. that's different than what you're describing. Yeah, that's the accuracy of the spatial data, mm -hmm. but we separate document where we actually assess the auto key itself mm -hmm. expert plot assignments to see whether or not how much they agree right okay Great. okay Thanks. so that's separate mm -hmm. darren do you want to um address that geospatial workflow for the mvc raster and some of the differences between the ecological system one and the mvc one yeah um, 
uh, EBT is based on ecological systems classification, which uh, was basically existed um, when we did the first go around of land fire, what we call land fire national. And um, so the, the difference there is just, it's a different classification system and the workflow is essentially the same. So those auto keys, there was a set of auto keys for that would um, label plots to the NBC class and it would label the same plot to a uh, second the second classification, the um, ES, the ecological systems. So we um, modeled and then brought in the same, um, you know, non-vegetated classes like um, ag and urban. Um, I will say, you know, we, we not every not all classes were modeled. Some of the some classes were are ruderal and they were modeled, um, but then there are other rural classes that we labeled using um, wildland urban interface uh, layer. And, um, and then some of the urban, various urban types are modeled as well with using uh, NLCD as a basis for where to locate those. So, um, and I can, you know, help, if you have questions about specific classes and where they come from, I can help answer those, but it'll all be um, explained in the report that Inga mentioned. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think I had a couple of specific questions that I listed here, but I also was just looking for something to read to make sure that I just, in a broader sense, understand um, sort of where this NBC raster comes from. I know it has something to do with the field plots, and then there's soils and topography and climate and some other layers, but I'm not totally clear how all those pieces fit together. Yeah. Um, I have a flow chart pulled up here. I could share my screen. Let's see. Share screen. Not a routine Zoom user. Oh, there it is. Yeah, so um, this was a flow chart we pulled together for EVT, um, which, you know, existing vegetation type using the two classification systems that I mentioned. So those are over here on the right, ES, ecological systems, and then NBCS, which is the one sounds like you're using based on the more newly developed classification system, and it's still in development getting firmed up, I would say. So the, the um, information you just mentioned, like the LFRDB and the Landsat imagery and gradients and topography, that's what feeds into the model and it's a uh, supervised classification. So we're using field plots to train the model for what, you know, basically the signature in that, uh, in those predictor layers to map every pixel. Um, you know, we're splitting out the vegetation types to life form so that we can get it to um, be consistent with our vegetation cover and height layers, which doesn't sound like you're using, but that's why, um, why that's there. And then we develop these other masks that sounds like are important for your work um, for um, agriculture, um, for urban areas, um, we have a process for water disturbed areas. Um, and so that's all used to determine where to put the appropriate classes. Um, these are all modeled by um, EPA level three ecoregion um, as a sort of modeling area. And then that's how and it gets all put together in the end, um, you know, we get those two um, products. So I'm hoping that this kind of shows you what we're using to train the model is the LFRP and then what's used to predict, what's it used as predictor layers are those layers you mentioned. So that's how, in a big picture, how it comes together. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
yeah, this is helpful. And it looks like maybe there's some manual review inside this Navy box. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, a, it's an iterative process. Get a, uh, you know, initial outputs and then refine it from there. Things don't always work out of the box, but um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's what that's representing. <laughs> I'm guessing, Darren, this will be in the report, for example, this flowchart. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Great, thank you. And Melanie, I want to expound on something quickly that Darren mentioned, which is mm -hmm. the NVC classification, especially in the East, is relatively immature. And okay. we found issues with it, and others have too, and we're actually in the process of discussing with the uh, Ecological Society of America, their panel uh, mm -hmm. basically has some, some input into the NVC about some changes that may need to be made to NVC. So it is not a final classification as, as of this point. Uh, mm -hmm. It has been, especially in the East, because it was relatively new in the East, and this is the first time I think anybody's tried to map it at any, at, over any kind of geographic scope, um, then we have learned some things that need to be modified. You know, okay. what are the ranges of the NVC types and things like that, which still need to be uh, uh, finalized, I would say. And so we're talking about that with, with ESA, um, GAP, and some others about how we can improve that. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. I think I chose the NVC mainly because it looked like it was going to be standard moving forward, um, but I'm still kind of early enough in this process that I could swap out and use the ecological systems instead. Um, so it, it is the de facto standard. It's just not what I would call mature. Mm -hmm. Because it's, okay. the, it's the first time anybody's actually tried to actually apply it to mapping, you know, across so, something like the Eastern U.S. Um, right. And I don't know, you know, we did, we did find some issues in trying to model. And Darren could probably expound on that in trying to model NBC. Um, just, just had some real issues. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. It's, it's going to be different in the future, although it may take a couple of years before we would say those changes have been made and finalized. Right. Okay. Thanks. So, Melanie, I wanted to... Uh kind of capture a couple of things while we're just before they, they leave my mind at least. So Darren, thank you for offering to share that um, that cropland data layer to land fire cross log table. Um, Jim, you mentioned um, sending more information on auto keys. And I wanted to throw out a couple other things, Melanie, that that I for you to consider. Um, as you work up slides or your paper, um, you know, some of us at Land Park could review if you want um, to help, you know, clarify any methods, questions there. We've done that before for people. Um, so please uh, reach out if that would be helpful to you. Um, I, don't, I don't think you're going to need that, but if you, if you want it, let us know. We'll be happy. We'd, we'd love to read your paper. So I have those three things down as to-do items, and I wondered if, uh, I didn't want to call off the discussion, but wanted to make sure I captured those, those things. Oh, and Melanie, yes, I will connect you with the folks at Northern Arizona University. Um, I, I just, yeah, it's almost awkward. I wonder how similar their work is. I don't know it well enough to know. It's, I don't think they're doing the floral resource quantification that you're doing, but I know they're trying to model the habitat thing So with, with bees. So anyways, maybe you and I can chat about that via email just because I don't want, you know, I don't know. It could be a little bit weird if it is as close of work as I think it is. Mm -hmm. Well, at least at the moment, I'm not doing anything in desert systems in Southwest area. So I suspect okay. we wouldn't overlap in that sense. Okay, great. That's helpful. I had a quick question if I could interject real quickly. Um, Hi, April. Yeah. Hey, um, I was just curious, just because um, 
uh, in the fire work that we do, we just have always been using the EVT, and so we really haven't used the NBC version. And and so it's a product that I'm not familiar with with the land fire uh, data delivery. And from my understanding, if I'm understanding the flow of the conversation, it's kind of a newer pro product. I'm just curious what the differences are that you see between the two and maybe what the advantages would be between the two for using uh, one or the other, like for Melanie's kind of work or for um, fuel modeling kind of thing. Um, would you guys be able to talk a little bit to that? Um, <clears throat> I can get a few points in there. So, um, you know, I think it, one of the things I put in the chat there, there's a lot fewer MVC classes uh, than there are ecological system classes, especially for the natural vegetation uh, uh, splits that we have. So, um, so that's one huge difference. And then the other uh, being that we don't have field model assignments for MVC. Um, and so, um, <clears throat> you know, that would be one huge limitation um, right now. Although we do, you know, we are talking about like, you know, what would it take <laughs> to um, to get fuel fuels for those uh, classes? The, I mean, if you think about it, there's 40 Scott and Bergen, so really having less MVC classes might not be, you know, that big of an issue um, to assign 40 um, fuel, fuel models. So, so that's, I don't know if, uh, does anyone have anything to add to that? Yeah, I'll add a couple of things, April. One, one is, is that in theory, NVC is the standard from the FGDC. It is, it's just, it's too new to, for a lot of people to have actually adopted, okay? And Inga is right, there is, they're both considered mid-scale ecological classifications, NVC as well as ecological systems. And there's a one-to-one -one correspondence a good bit of the time, and we actually have a crosswalk, which we could provide you it shows you how we've crosswalked them in the past. We've, we've actually produced uh, NVC in the past. It was just a crosswalk from ecological systems. It wasn't, in, we didn't attempt to map it as an individual product, okay? And uh, so we always had NVC. Um, it is the de facto standard, but uh, we're, we're hoping at some point to make it a primary land fire deliverable, but there's still some work to do, I think, to transition our processes, to make the classification more mature, et cetera, for that to be the case, you know, because we've been mapping ecological systems, what, 17 years now, you know, so, you know, as opposed to a few years for, for NVC. So there's still some work to do there, but we can provide you a crosswalk if you want to see how they crosswalk, because um, we have done it in the past. Okay, that, that sounds great. And I think um, maybe my question was kind of a little more from the perspective if you saw um, an advantage in terms of accuracy or precision mm -hmm. in, in the uh, remotely sensed data in, in getting to these classifications. But it sounds more like there's the standard and, and it's great well, to kind of... Uh, I'll let Darren answer, but I will tell you, of course, there's fewer classes you would tend to do better if everything was equal because there are fewer NVC classes if everything was equal. But I don't think everything is equal, honestly, from my perspective, because I don't think we know enough about NVC. An advantage to NVC is the hierarchical nature of the NVC, you know, going from alliance to association to, you know, formation, to blah, blah, you know, I don't remember all those things, but, but that is something that, uh, that could be important in the future uh, in, in being able to fit into that hierarchical classification. Um, so I will, uh, but I will suggest that I, I would say right now, we're probably more comfortable with ecological systems, but you know, that's, that's the bed we've been sleeping in for 17 years. That, that all makes sense. I, I appreciate that. I don't know. Yeah, if that they are the, um, they are very similar. Um, most, from, from what I can tell, most of the NBC groups were pulled from ecological systems. A lot of the descriptions are copy-paste. So they're, oh, okay. 
they're very, yeah, they're very um, consistent. Most, most crosswalk one-to-one. Um, but um, so I pulled up the hierarchy here and our map is at the group level, which is, yes, like Jim said, mid scale. And then, you know, there's fine scale below it. Um, some of the ecological systems would crosswalk to alliances. So you might have, you know, a handful, five or so ecological systems that would crosswalk all to one group. So that's where you're getting the, um, the, the fewer classes. Um, but, again, you know, a lot of, some of those might have similar, some of them might have different fuels. And um, so I think if we, if we do transition to using MVC for fuels, we're going to have to look closely at that. Are we losing, you know, resolution by going, by staying just at the group level? That makes sense. And I, I feel like that's something that uh, we wouldn't really know until we got into some of the nitty gritty. <laughs> and, right. And looked at it. Okay. Um, and I, I had one other question if there is um, time for that. And that just relates back again to uh, Melanie's question kind of about um, the report and the update. And so um, if my understanding is correct, then you would be updating the report for the 2016 product. So then would there also be an update to that report for the product that's coming out this year, because I, I know that there's been uh, quite a bit of discussion about um, some of like the developed rural and everything. Um, and so it would just be really great um, to have a product to refer people to um, in our discussions uh, with, with clients about what we're using and how that works out. Yeah, um, originally I had put some of the 2020 information into that technical document. Um, but we're going to pull it out and make it its own thing. Um, so it's, it's well on its way. April, it still has some, uh, some, um, you know, I got to put some of that stuff together. So, uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's in the, in the works there for 2020 as well. That's awesome. That's great. Thank you. So um, any other questions about bees or the MVC or veg classification or about anything. Um, we're coming up on 10 minutes before the planned close of this meeting. Um, so just wanted to open the floor if there are comments on what's been discussed so far or totally new topics that you wanted to bring up. You can throw those in the chat if you're like eating lunch and don't want to eat on the camera. Um, but we would love to see you if you feel like turning your camera on and asking a question. Uh, Melanie, I, I would be interested in some of the um, other data sets that you found um, that you thought might be helpful for us. Um, so yeah, if we can kind of follow up on that point, that would be great. Yeah, sure. I mean, it was mostly um, either published papers or collaborators of mine that had done vegetation surveys um, at various points. Mm -hmm. And before I learned about land fire, I, I mean, I, I actually have some of my own data too that I didn't, wouldn't have known to contribute to land fire because <laughs> I didn't know that land fire existed or that that database existed. So. Yes, we mostly what I've been doing. <laughs> I guess yeah. maybe one question about that. Um, I've been adding data sets that were surveys in agricultural areas. Does that fit under the purview of land fire or not? Because those aren't actually modeled vegetation types. Yeah, it's something we haven't um, really talked about yet. Darren, do you have a perspective on that? Um. Well, would any of them fit like a rural, a rural type, like an old field, or are they all active agriculture? Um, well, the so, some of each. I mean, we've done like roadside, roadside ditches, and some that are old fields, non-active. Yeah, that that we would model. You know, anything that's basically not active. Um, you know, if if they're not um, planting and 
managing it um, and it's semi-natural, then we would want information on where those are because we do model that to separate it from the natural veg, like what would be more like prairie or something mm -hmm. out here um, as you move west. But yeah, if it's active, then we're taking all that from CDL. So I guess anything okay. that would fall into one of those CDL classes, we, we wouldn't be using. At this time, we don't, our, our workflow doesn't use it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Outstanding. Well, um, thanks, Melanie. Tons. It sounds like we all have a little bit of follow-up, so this is really great. Um, these questions help us to better understand what users are doing and it kind of helps us compile our thoughts. There's so many data sets and so many people. Um, as you guys might know, I'm with the Nature Conservancy's Lampire team, and I, I think I've seen you a couple times, Darren, so it's good to see you. Um, if nothing else, so thanks for Melanie, you kind of brought us together, which is fun. Um,